or a steady word. Okay, they have words that have meaning. There's literature, so yeah. a lot of words for kids because I'm one of these people that thinks that the um, government has nothing to do with school. That belongs in the family. And I'll show you the reason why as we go through these, uh, these slides. Some of the common myths about Bible and uh, about the Bible and Jesus is that the B the Bible is only concerned with salvation. I'm not going to undervalue salvation; it's very important. But I'm, I'm going to tell you about salvation as we go through this. Uh, they're going to also tell you that Jesus was not concerned about social reform, and they'll also tell you that religion and politics should be kept separate. And the Bible addresses all of this, and I'm going to show you how they're going to be addressed as we go through this. Okay, when God put Adam and Eve, uh, Eve on the earth for action, they, had, they were supposed to cultivate and keep the garden. So that means they had to work, okay? So Christian responsibility, it didn't go away. So we're still working today. So it started there. We're just continuing that, that what, we, what God started. Um, God is the maker of heaven and earth, and he desires that his will be done on both of them. So whatever we do here on earth, his will be done in heaven because he owns the whole thing. All right? Let's come from Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is very important because sometimes I think one of our biggest problems is we have a very shallow view of who God is. And if you don't know who God is, you're going to have yourself a big problem. you got to get yourself a very high view of God. Because when you start to realize who God is, you'll start to realize where you are relative to God. And that'll put your way down here. And then that'll drive a little humility, which is what we need. We need a lot of that. So. <clears throat> okay. The scripture is kind of our guidebook for how we ought to live in the world he created. Okay. The beautiful thing about this, and I tell people, this is why Christianity is beautiful. If you do what God tells you to do, it just makes life so simple. But when you go outside that realm, guess what? You run into problems. So, it's the only religion in the world now that can state that our Lord and Savior walked as a man with his people right here on this earth. We're the only ones that can state that. That is seriously important because now he knew what we were doing down here. So he touched us. He physically touched us. He was here with us. All right? Um, John 1 4, the same thing, the, the word uh, became flesh, he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No other religion in the world can state this. This is what sets us apart from everyone else. And don't be afraid to say it. All right? And then he handed me both of them. This is critical. When Jesus was on the earth, he worked as a carpenter. Did you know that? He worked as a carpenter. This reinforces the work mandate from the garden. He did physical labor. He did actually do labor while he was here. All right? He received his training at home. All right? He also healed people, provided food for the masses. The Bible also states that we to take care of the widows and the orphans. These actions were not assigned to the government. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I hear people talk about what the government's doing today. We are so far out of whack, we don't know where we we've lost it. All right? We got agency on top of agency on top of agency on top of agency on top of agency. And I'll be honest with you, I can't even name them all. Every time I go to a meeting, I hear about another agency. I'm like, where'd that come from? And that's this is what's happening. And the sad thing is, it's become the norm now. And we just think it's normal. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about this little bit of salvation now. The Bible message of salvation is the starting point and it's central, and it's central to the Bible. But it does not end there. This is what I want to tell you. A baby Christian has to grow and you got to dig a little deeper. Okay? Um, if, you're not, if you don't understand the Bible, then what the world you live in is not going to make sense to you. Morality is not going to make sense to you. And God defines what is normal. You don't. Amen. That's critical. 
So you think you can put it in your mind what you think what normal should be, you're going to run into a problem. God defines what is normal, okay? This is the word of caution I'd like to tell all my friends that are out there. Don't start in Revelation. Please don't. <laughs> that drives me crazy when I talk to a young Christian and they get excited and they start telling me about what's going to happen at the end of the world. Wait a minute, let's start at the beginning first and make sure you understand that. Then we'll get to that part. You got so much in between here that you ain't got time to be worried about what's going on down at the other part. And even when you get there, if you don't understand what happened, you're going to get all this confounded and confused, and then you're going to confuse yourself and then confuse other young Christians around. That is very dangerous. All right? So don't start in Revelation. So without a foundation, you got to have historical background, hermeneutics is the study of words. You got to know that. You got to understand the symbolism. You got to understand the context. Uh, if you don't, you're going to lead to more myths and more confusion. When I start to ask people, a lot of people throw out, I call them all, one verse willing. They throw out a, a verse at me. They think they prove something. Then I start asking, well, what's the context? They walk away because they don't know the context. If you don't know the context, I can make the Bible say anything I want to. So you got to understand that. Okay? So the point I'm trying to make here is that the foundation, again, is critical. And one thing I want to point to people, and this is very critical also, Christ is the center of that Bible. If you don't see Christ in that Bible, we got problems on it. You missed the boat. Christ is the center of the Bible. You better see it in the Old Testament, and you better see it in the New Testament. Because if you don't, I'm telling you, you've missed something here. Now, I'm not telling you to force fit it there, but you need to understand how it's connected. Because if you miss that, you're going to miss a lot. If I start preaching now, you stop. Preach away. Preach away. Now, I don't want, again, I want you to think that salvation is undervalued because salvation is very important. And let me tell you the reason why it's important. Because a man, okay, has a heart of stone. People don't like to hear that. But see, we're bad to the core. We don't have to teach you how to be bad. You know how to be bad. We got to teach you how to be good. So that heart of stone has to turn into a heart of flesh. Only Christ can do that. A lot of people think they can reach down, pull up their bootstraps, and do, I can do it myself. No, you got to look for Christ for that. I'm sorry. I hate to tell you that and burst your bubble, but here's where humility comes in. You have to focus on Christ. You cannot focus on yourself. You're going to get in trouble. All right. You have been made alive who are dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this also has to extend to society. It can just be you. <clears throat> so when this brother goes out, he hears the gospel, he goes out and spread it, I hear the gospel, I go out and spread it, and guess what starts to happen? We start to have an impact on society. We can't just hold it in, we got to go out with it. The Bible was intended and the gospel was intended to go out because it needs to go out. You can't change the society. I can put all the laws in the world, but if a man's going to decide he's going to break it, he'll find a way to break it. That's why I love it when they have these like gun law discussions. Oh, we got to do this, we got to do Let me tell you something. If somebody want to kill you, they'll do, they'll do it. They will find a way to kill you. It doesn't have to be with a gun. They'll do it. All right? And by the way, it has nothing to do with age. Because remember, I told you, you're bad from the beginning. All right. You see how all this is starting to come together now? Rush generally said the key to remedying the modern situation is not a revolution nor any kind of resistance that works to subvert law and order. The New Testament's abound in warning against disobedience and in summons to peace. Okay? The key is regeneration, propagation of the gospel, and the conversion of men, and notice it said nations to God's law of order. Nations, not just the U.S., nations have to be converted. Okay, this is coming from the gospel. This word that we have in our hands has that kind of power. I was telling my buddy here, for some reason, everybody comes to me and says, Leonard, they said, we can't do anything now because we don't have the manpower, the resources. But well, when I read my Bible, 
I have never seen God work on volume. He worked on obedience. When they were going out and they were on a mission and they were complaining, well, we don't have enough people to do this. You know what God told them? You do what you're supposed to do, I'll take care of the rest of it. Right. You just do what you're supposed to do. That's what he told them. Now, politics and conservative economic policy and other social oriented agendas were not in and of themselves the answer to man's condition. Because we are centered, once again, we can't make proper evaluation of what is good or how to live in the world until we have a new heart. So you gotta have that heart first. That heart is critical. If you don't get the heart, guess what? It ain't gonna make sense. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Someone asked me, they said, why is it that you come to work with a smile every day? I said, because it's very simple. I get up every day asking, first of all, I thank God for letting me have another day. You get up in the morning and let me have the opportunity, no matter how big or how small, to do what's right in your name and to bring glory to you. I don't care if it's five minutes. If I get a chance, that one chance is worth it. All right, because I don't know how God's going to use that word. But I do know this, if I keep it bound up inside, it ain't going to get out. All right? So, let's move it right along here. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Now, here's a word that we don't like to talk about sometimes. When it says the command to subdue the earth means bringing all earth systems and processes in a state of optimum productivity and utility. Now, when they were in the Bible, in the, in the garden, in the garden where they started, they had everything they wanted, didn't they? and they blew it. They didn't have an economy there. All right? You know when the economy started? When they blew it, now they had to work at it. So now they had to be valuing what they were doing. So that's the basis of an economy. And also things were scarce now. Because now since the, 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 the ground was hard, they had to work at it now. So now that's what you call economizing. And that's where economy started, right there from the, uh, the, the Bible in Genesis. Do people make that connection? No. They miss that. All they say is Adam and Eve did this and da da da. They tell the little children's stories about what Adam and Eve did, and then that's about it. But there's a whole lot there. All right, now. This is another one that we're afraid to use. We're afraid to use the word dominion, all right? You can't escape dominion because somebody is going to take charge somewhere, all right? The question is, what standard are you going to use for that dominion? That's the question. I'm sorry. I'm so now the question is, what standard will be used if we take, if we take dominion, all right? My contention is, once again, and don't be afraid to say this. If you don't do it, it doesn't disappear, okay? Because if a man denounces it, or he renounces it, it simply is transferred to another person. So if a man doesn't leave his family, you know what's gonna happen? His wife's gonna take charge by default, all right? Uh, or his children's gonna get out of control, which is what we see in the society today. Children are running their family now. Or the employer, or more importantly, what we see now is the state takes charge. And we got a lot of state taking charge of everything. All right? So somewhere down the line, somebody is going to exercise dominion over you somewhere. Now, personally, I would like to make sure that I infuse what I believe into the system instead of having somebody force something on me. And I want that force that I'm infusing to be grounded in Christ. Not in anything else. All right? Don't be afraid to say it. Now, here's what's different between our era and the era of the Reformation period. All right? They applied the Bible to everything. All right? Vocation, marriage, economics, family, education, politics, so, and you name it. So now, can you imagine? Comparing this to where we are today, I don't even know if anybody even picks up a Bible hardly anymore. 
That's a shame. As a matter of fact, I can tell you right now, as shameful as this may sound, I can go and ask a lot of pastors about the Reformation and how we live. They couldn't tell you. And I, I can tell you right now, that percentage is very large of pastors that don't know the basics. That's sad. That's a sad commentary. Right. That's why I love this dear brother right here. When I hear him going off at the God, it just excites me. Because that lets me know that God has saved his remnant and we're going to keep on keeping on. All right? Now, here's all the stuff I wanted to share with you that you might miss if you don't get this. All right? Look at all the stuff that's in here about the Bible that you might miss if you don't. Take the time and read it. The Bible and the family, all this stuff, your marriage between a man and a woman. Notice it's a man and a woman. It's funny how God didn't confuse that, did <laughs> See, just imagine, if, just imagine if God gets confused. See, God didn't leave us with confusion. That's the beautiful thing about this. That's why I said if you do what he tells you to do, you don't have to worry about these, you know, he, she, them, it, whatever. I don't know what it is anymore. But anyway. <laughs> Discipline, education, charity, all of that stuff, it's in there. But it didn't stop there. Guess what? I can find this too. Economics. Look at all this. Debt, borrowing, lending, interest, inflation. Oh, inflation. Didn't we just talk about inflation? We're going to tip on that a little bit too. <laughs> helping the needy, inheritance. Now, who's helping the needy more than the church is right now? Government. Government's doing it. Okay. Inheritance, we're going to talk about what you were talking about with the property tax. Yeah. Okay? Work, concept of work. But guess what? It still keeps going. There's more about economics, wages, employee employee relationship, savings, fraud, investments. This is beautiful. See, and I don't have to create anything. It's just all, right, look at this. Civil government, it even goes as far as that talking about. Civil authority, citizenship, bribery, taxation, the military, national defense, all of this is in there. But I guarantee you, we miss it because we're not looking for it. We're looking for other things not related to these things. So that's why we miss a lot. All right? Now, I can go on even further. It talks a little bit about the law, judicial system. You see what is happening with our court system, right? We got laws regarding, regarding perverting and obstructing justice, perjury, murder, assault, kidnapping, slander. This is, this is amazing to me when I go back and look at the detail now. And we were talking about growing, how you read and you get more and more detail. This is very exciting to me because now I keep looking at this and I say, you know what, every time I... I look at something happening in the world, I go and look and see what God said about it, and then I say, ooh, wait a minute. I think y'all missed the boat on this one. You missed the boat. So, this is a beautiful thing, folks. Look at this, the Bible and more laws, stealing, arson, property violation, again, property violations. Got a lot of that going on. Damages, restitution. You know restitution is actually tied to property, too? You know if somebody did something? on your property, they, they used to pay restitution for it. Yeah. Do you know that in the Constitution there was indentured service due, servitude is still legal? <coughs> Did you know that? Still there? Just break some measures. You want to talk about that too? What does that mean? Okay. Ooh, we this stuff. See, I'm getting excited about this. Look at this. The Bible and morality. Abortion. Homosex homosexuality. Well, we can go on for that one. Slavery, rape, prostitution, incest, adultery, bestiality. Wow. Look at all this. I mean, all these scripture references. And there's still more in there I didn't even capture because I'm still going myself. Okay? Now, this other myth about Jesus not being concerned about social reform. Okay? Now, let me tell you where we go off track here. Now, Jesus he wasn't never, he was never married, right? But he blessed the institution of marriage. He performed the first miracle at the wedding in Cana. He repeated some of the, one of the earlier commands in the Bible. Now, 
a lot of people would say, well, Leonard, the thing is, they try to justify because Jesus wasn't married, then certain priests shouldn't be married. Well, I said, wait a minute now. You're telling me you're trying to compare yourself to Jesus? See, the humility thing is gone again. What, what are you doing here? Jesus came for a specific mission. And if that mission was not accomplished, guess what, folks? We'd be in bad shape. So he had a mission here. That, his mission wasn't come here to do that. You got to understand what did he come for? He came for a specific mission. Okay? He told you what it was for, but that wasn't his mission. He's telling you the guidelines for the marriage. So if you go out and get married, he's blessing the marriage. He said, go do it. Okay? <laughs> so to say he wasn't concerned about social reform, that's crazy. All right? He didn't own a property or a house either, did he? Okay? But does that mean he condemns uh, condemns a Christian from owning one? No. He said the same for being poor. He said the poor were going to be with us, right? Did he tell you to take a vow of poverty and that's going to make you better? He didn't say that. All right? What he said was, if someone has a lot of money, he can readily take care of his family, which is a good thing, okay? And he can give it to others as he sees fit to help them out. Notice I said give it to him now. I didn't say take it from him. Give it to him. All right? Now, the reason why I say give it to him, let's look at James 2, 14 through 8. It said, what is it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says of them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you don't give them, give them the things which are needed for their body, what is it profit? Thus also faith by itself that does not have works is dead. So if you if you saying something, but you ain't living it, that's not the question whether or not what you really believe in. Okay? Um, my boss was asking me the other day, he said, Lenny, when are you going to retire? I said, why, is it bothering you? <laughs> I said, there's no such word as retirement in the Bible. So if I'm enjoying what I'm doing, why why are you why is it bothering you? Well, you might you don't know what could happen. Well, you don't know what could happen to you. You could walk out and die tomorrow too. You don't know that. You're you're not guaranteed. I said, but the most important thing for me is that I said the more money I can make, the more I can help our brothers and sisters in Christ. I can spread it around. And he just looks at me like I'm crazy. You know why? Because the concept is foreign to him. They're going out, they're living above their means, and I choose not to do that. I choose to say, I can do, I want, to, I want the kingdom to expand. So if I can use my money to help grow and develop that, God has blessed me when I have lived a wonderful life. Anything beyond this is just icing on the cake. So I say, if he can use me, and I can use the money that I make to give to somebody else and help them, then my goodness, then I'm going to do it. And you can ask me to retire all you want to. I'm still not going to retire. Okay? Um, I'll be crushing. <laughs> in a nutshell, you have to do something to have an impact. You can't just sit around and just talk about it. You got to do something. That's why my brother said, you got to get out. You got to put some feet on those prayers. You can't just be praying and think the money just going to drop that. You got to put some feet on it. And that's what you have to do. So he was telling you there's social, there is, that's social reform. You got to do something, all right? Like housing, like housing. Yes. Like housing. Here's another one that's bad. Religion and politics should be kept separate. This is one I like. They said, well, oh, no, see, you shouldn't be. See, you know what your problem is. You're trying to infuse your religion. I said, wait a minute now. We, you know, I see these flags being flown. You know, I get confused because I don't know what or not. Because I don't know which one is which. Now. They got the, what is the pride flag and one. Then they got the state flag and that. And I said, wait a minute. Now, where do y'all put the pride flag? Where does that go? And they said, oh, we have to, it's not religious, but we put it up here because we want to show we're diverse. I said, well, put the Christian flag up there. Oh, we can't do that. That's a religion. Well, that's a religion. Now, he believes what he thinks is right. I believe what I think is right. So that's a religion. That's politics. So you can't escape that. All right? 
And all law is a reflection of some moral code. Don't let nobody fool you. Okay? There are tens of thousands of books, of laws on the books. They tell you how to live by as far as how fast you can drive a car, how to, much money you have to pay taxes, and the whole works. So don't tell me that someone's not forcing something on you. They are. That's a moral code. Because they think it's right. Okay? It's gonna, I'm going to go even further with this. In every society, there got to be some kind of basic law. If not, we'd be running crazy. We'd be going amok. Because, like I said, we don't need people to tell us we're bad. You let us go, we'll run crazy. Okay? Now, the Ten Commandments has done this for Western civilization for centuries. And you know what we've done? Every time we see it, we strip it down. Strip it off, strip it off. You know why? Because we don't want that thrown in our face. Because you know why? It convicts you of sin. And we don't want to see ourselves as being bad. We want to think we're good. So when we see that, we go, oh, I can't be that bad. Well, no, you're bad. <laughs> okay? The Ten Commandments has made worship, family, property, and moral integrity basic to man and society, and that has been that way since day one. Okay? This is critical. We've been using this, and now, so now it's not a question of whether or not morality is going to be legislated, but Hughes' view is going to be legislated. Okay? You can't go mixing them all up. Now, Somebody told me, they said, you can have all of them together. Now, you can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because God said, I will have no other God before me. Amen. We're scared to say that. We want to be inclusive, diverse. Well, I am being diverse. I'm telling you, you can live with me, but you're going to live by what God tells you to do. That's very diverse, don't you think? I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything to you. I'm just telling you, you're going to have to follow the law just like me. <laughs> All right, now, somebody got to decide if something is right or wrong. You can't escape that. All right? Go a little further here. If religion is at the core, Christianity needs to be the driver for law and politics. It should be the only foundation. Any other foundation, you get away from that, guess what? You're running into problems, folks. You're going to hit a brick wall. You know why I know this? Because my mother gave me basic Christian principles to live by. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but one thing about Christianity, the church during that time had a lot of influence. And I remember vividly on Sunday morning how we were here with church bells. That's how important the church was. Everybody stopped what they were doing. The local drunks, gamblers, everybody. Even the non-Christians recognized, oh, you know what, we have to stay to fly, right? Because Pastor might come by. My parents recognize it. So they told me, you better do this, you better do this. So even though they were not Christian, they were under the Christian influence. So I knew at that point, at that time, that's what saved me. Christianity is what saved my life. It wasn't anything else. Because they had let me run amok and do what I wanted to do, I would have been a bad boy. So they had to they had to force this on me. Alright, so that moral code they instilled upon me when I was a young kid. And even when I wasn't a Christian, I recognized one thing. When I got out of school, I said, I gotta go to find a church. I can't be out here roaming the streets. I can't do it. So that Christian influence is critical. The Bible is to be used as a guideline for government and the people. Both of them. Not just for one, the government has to follow it too. You can't have separate rules. All right, so everybody got to play by the same rules here. Let's go with Marxism here. Show you where, I'm going to tell y'all right now. We think we live in a free society. We are so far away from it. We, as a matter of fact, we, we're more socialist than Marxist than what people realize. I'm on, I'm on, I wish I had enough time. I'm going to show you just where we are. Better than where Marx told us we would be. And do you know that some Christians think this is good? 
This is, this is what I'm trying to tell you. I'm telling you, the world's going loopy. I'm telling you. Now, Marx stated a national bank monopoly and concentration of centralization of credit in his hands. In other words, you take the one big organization and let them control everything, OK? And that's why y'all all know about the Federal Reserve, right? We all know about that. Now, Gary North wrote this, inflation of all the dangers of the free market economy, historically and theoretically, the greatest is this one. It is the one that subject of those subjects that remain wrapped in mystery for the average citizen. The average citizen ain't got a clue what I'm talking about. You bring this up and they say, what are you talking about? They don't know. And it's a shame that this is who's controlling us right now. And we don't know about it. All right? We talk about high gas prices and all the kinds of stuff, but I'm going to tell you what's really going on. It, the price of gas is not, is not the issue. The price of the food is not the issue. I'm going to tell you what the real issue is. So the whole is just holding in your seats. I'm going to get there. All right? Now, it must be understood that we are to return to the free market for without a thorough comprehension of inflation's mechanism, what's, what's the mechanism for inflation? And it's dangerous. We'll continue to enslave our, we'll enslave ourselves. We don't need the government to do it. We'll do it ourselves. All right. That's why I was so glad when you started talking about your property taxes. Yeah. Somebody with fixed income would eventually get thrown out of their house. Yes, yeah, eventually. Well. And then listen to what he said. Listen to what he said. He said, "We don't want to put liens." on people's homes and throw them out of their home. Wait a minute. They paid for their home. The paid, you're telling me somebody spent their whole life paying for the house and they can get kicked out like that because they can't. What's wrong with you? Listen to yourself. Are you not thinking through this? OK, stop and think for a moment. Oh my god, I go crazy sometimes. OK? Does anybody still need to pay, guys? Yeah, I do. OK. Yeah. I got it. Thank you. You're not paying for mine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're doing a good job. Well, thank you. Now, let me tell you what inflation is, okay? Just so you know about this. It's an increase in the money supply. All right? Everybody keeps talking about the war in Ukraine and everything else. That's just a diversion. They want you to think that. Okay? And by the way, the U.S. is actually responsible for getting this whole thing started. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about that, but that, that's a whole other stuff. That's a, that's a topic to take offline. They were the <laughs> ones that got this whole thing started in the first place. They created the They created it. Okay. But anyway, um, it's an increase. It's not an increase in prices. Everybody sees, oh, gas is fine. Up. No. Let me tell you something. If you look at, we'll go down here and talk about the reality of that example, but I want to show you that's not the cause of our problem. An artificial increase in the money supply is inflation. Chasing the same number of goods causes the prices to rise. Okay? Now, national, natural scarcity also results in higher prices. Higher prices from scarcity are the result of market forces. So over time, <coughs> Price equilibrium will reset the price without any need for government interference. So if you keep the government out of it, guess what? It'll correct itself. You don't need, because if you start artificially messing around with stuff, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get it out of kilter. If you try to get it back in kilter, you'll be chasing yourself way up. Now, that's why you'll notice now they're talking about increasing the interest rate. Well, let me tell you something. They're talking about they can't do it too fast. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> what are you going to do when you get to a higher point? Then you're going to hurt a whole other sector of the environment. So in other words, you got yourself into a quagmire. Now, I don't want to alarm anybody, but I want to tell you this. Here is a little known fact. No country in the history of the world has printed itself into prosperity. It has never happened. You can't print your way out of this. End of story. Okay? Now, governments are responsible for inflation today since they control the money supply. That's what's happening. Now, 
That's why you notice when people start talking about grants and all this kind of stuff, where's that money coming from? Yeah. It comes from us, but the grant for this, money. a grant for that, a grant. Wait a minute. A grant for this and that. Dad, you're going to love this one. My buddy is a commissioner in an area I can't even mention where it is. But they had a, uh, a meeting. And he said, oh, you know, he's a good friend of mine. He said, well, you're not going to believe this. He said, uh, we had to spend, we had to find a way to spend all the money that we have. Mm -hmm. I said, really? He said, yeah, because if we don't, then the government's going to stop giving us the funds. Public said, schools. Public schools. And my <laughs> wife was told when she was a teacher, <laughs> I said, you told her, <laughs> you've got to spend that money. Yeah. You're going to buy the my, my wife says, I don't need those books anymore. <laughs> I need computers. But we don't care. You've got to spend the money on books. Yeah. So I said, Scott, you, you need this. Yeah. I said, listen to you. So he said, I tried to convince him, but he's all upset. I said, now you see what I'm trying to go with. But I'm glad he's in that position so he can see the reality of what he's doing. Okay? Now, it's a form of theft because it devalues your money that people have in their wallets or a savings account. It's like adding water to soup or water to wine. That's in Isaiah 21, 23. You're kind of watering it down a little bit. But you actually, that's what inflation is. Yeah. All right? Now, it's an invisible tax also. You can't see it coming. But when you start spending your money, it's like, man, it took me $50 to fill my car this time. Okay? <laughs> Same car you to spend $25. Now, here's the example I was going to give you. See, what $1,000 would buy in 1982, you would need $3,000. $56 today. In 1950, it would take $12,302 today to equal the buying power of $1,000. So look at what happened in that time span. The next year going. All right? They can't control it anymore. <laughs> in other words, we're in some deep trouble, folks. Okay? Now, the Bible emphasizes hard currency, gold and silver. Gold is in Eden, and the gold of that land, God said it was good. Okay? Remember, they had everything they needed. They didn't have the federal government. They didn't have a printing press. So he gave them everything they needed. All right? So now, why is it that you think that gold and silver is the best thing for hard currency? <laughs> yeah, and see, here's another thing. See, because we're sinners, see, gold and silver is not abundant in nature. It's hard to come by. So it restrains us. We have to be restrained. So you have to tie this to something. So once you just release it, then there's nothing to constrain us. Remember, we're bad to the bone now. Just one thing you got to remember about us. We're bad. So if you don't try to go, so folks, I want to give you uh, just something. Buy yourself a little gold and silver. Not to make you rich, but it's a hedge against the inflation. So when that dollar has to reset, they're going to have to back it with something. I can't tell you how much the other countries are buying in gold right now. It's outrageous the amount of gold they're buying and silver. They're buying it like crazy. And I'm starting to wonder whether or not there's any in four dollars. <laughs> okay. The Bible considers inflation to be a violation of the law. Your silver has become dross, your drink and diluted with water. That's again in Isaiah. Money is something that can't be counterfeited, debased, or created ex nihilo, nihilo out of nothing. The Bible requires just weights and measures. You shall have just balances, just weights, just effort, and just hen. Now, the reason why you want to have just weights and measures. Now, I've been an engineer for 30 years now. Let's say I start changing the mechanism for how we measure things. Okay? You know what kind of habit that's going to create in my world? Yeah. All of a sudden I said, well, I'm just going to make, you know, 454 pounds, 3 grams, 3 kilograms instead of 2.5. Then the next step is going, can't do that. It'll drive the whole world. In other words, God has structure, even in the scientific world. So you can't even, so if it goes to the scientific world, it applies all over, okay? Bad money drives out good money. For example, silver coins were widely circulated in Canada until 1968, and then the United States until 1965 and 1971. 
two governments debate they debase their coins by switching to the cheaper metals. Okay? As the market value of silver rose above that of the face value. The silver coins disappear from circulation and citizens retain them in anticipation of a rise in value in the future. So if you look at your coins now, there's nothing in them. Nothing but junk. There used to be a lot of silver in there. Does it say in God we trust on the currency still? Well, yes. Oh, sorry. It does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. All right. That's all we got left. Yep. Now, dimes and quarters stopped being minted in 1964. Yeah. Uh, the Kennedy half dollar was was stuck struck in 19 in 90% silver in 1964. The following year, this was changed to silver clad, and the silver content lowered to 40%. And then in 1971, the circulation of coinage composition was changed a final time, eliminating the silver and using the copper nickel clad standard common to the dollar, quarter, and dime. So the silver that you used to see in there is gone. So that basically works. All right? There's no silver in any circulating United States. Just some financial history for you. We'll go through this briefly. Roosevelt confiscated the entire his nation's gold supply by executive order. You know, this executive order thing has gotten out of control, too. Yeah. There ain't no way in the Constitution for that. See, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, he grabbed it for the gov uh, for a government and mandated price of $20.67 an ounce. Then he began selling to foreign governments and banks nine months later for $35 an ounce. His executive tyranny was joined by congressional action in 1934. Thus did the federal government realize a return of 69% by decree of the gold it stole from the American people. All right? The Gold Reserve Act, that was in 1934. And then when Nixon unhinged the dollar from the last remaining ventures of gold exchange standard, uh, refusing the redemption of international debt for gold coins, this act floated the dollar completely. Now it's just, it's just out here. Do whatever you want to do. All right, so there's nothing left. Now you can just float it and we can just go with it. All right? So this is where we are, folks. I wanted to show this here because a lot of people say, Leonard, how do you know that that's true? I say, well, even if it isn't, I got a little surprise for you. Well, when Rothschild says, give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes the laws. And that's why I was telling you. There are two companies that control a lot of the money supply here in the world, and that's the Black Rock and Vanguard. And they got millions, man. And you think these politicians are not tied to them? You're kidding yourself. They are controlling more than what you realize. All right. So I say, even if you didn't, if I couldn't prove that, I can tell you this: the Federal Reserve, which is independent bankers, they're not even government. You know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Not government. Mm -hmm. It's controlling our economy since they manipulate their money supply at will, and many people are ignorant of basic economics. They don't know. So we print the money. How do we fool people? I'm paying money in higher gas, groceries, higher grocery bill, so they think that's what's going on. All right. Here's another good one. Education. Free education for all children in the public school system. Now, this gets to be very sensitive. I get to talking about this and people want to punch me because they're in the system. Yeah. Okay? Now, I said, let's get back to some basics here. What is education? Education is nothing but the transfer of knowledge. So when you're educating somebody, you're leaving them out of ignorance. So, in other words, I'm coming out, I don't know anything. And you're going to start teaching me something, okay? How to look at the world, you know, what's meaningful, whether it be a trade or whatever. So that's what education is. So, but when you come to teach somebody, you don't have a neutral, you don't come in with a blank slate yourself. You come in with some knowledge. Because you're going to transfer that knowledge to someone else, okay? So now, when you send your child to the public school system, do you think they come in neutral? No. They come in with something that they're going to introduce to your children. It's not biblical. Either. Yes. It's unbiblical. 
Now, you think it's going to line up to, the, to morality? No, it won't. Okay, now. So some people say, well, there's some good that you can do, Christians can do in the public school system. I said, listen to what you're saying. You're telling me that you spend one to two hours of, your, of time with your children each day. Eight hours in the public school system. Are you going to compete with that? Come on. Who are you kidding? Now, what has happened, the real problem is a breakdown in the family. Two parents have to work. Public school become a babysitter. Mama don't have time to do it anymore. Inflation. And inflation. Yeah. That's done in Texas. This is a direct attack on the family. Now, people can't put all this together. Now, how can anyone be neutral by anything? God always requires us to make decisions, even the decision leads to unpopular results. <coughs> You're neither for Christ or against him. A decision has to be made somewhere. Okay? So Joshua put it like this to his fellow Israelites. Either you serve Jehovah to serve gods of your fathers. There is nothing between the two choices. To forsake God is to serve other gods. So you got to be, you're not on this or that. You have to pick this out. So either you believe in what God tells you or you don't. It's that simple. All right? Now, some questions that have to be addressed. This is when I get into the big argument with my people that are in the public school system. Okay? Who exactly is doing the leading? What is the wisdom or knowledge of truth into which the student is to be led? Who determines what this is? And then who decides what ignorance is? Who decides what your child needs? Do they know your child? Maybe he wants to be a plumber. Maybe he wants to be a welder. Maybe he wants to be an electrician. You have to understand this when you come to the table. Okay? That requires individual development and attention. Okay? Now, parents don't have the time to dig into this. Now, people ask me, they said, Leonard, they said, you had the time and the money to homeschool your children. I said, well, no, that's not the case. I said, my wife and I made a conscious decision. We weren't going to be taking vacations to Europe and all this other stuff. We may go to Michigan or something like that or Pittsburgh and take a drive. But we just said, what was more important? You had to sacrifice. So mama pulled out the checkbook. You don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. And before I know it, I would get down to the bare bones. But it was good for me because she built discipline to help us to build discipline in the household because she said, I am not going to entrust my child into someone else's hand because she said the most important thing for my child is for that child to know who God is. Amen. That's where it starts. Because when he knows who God is, everything else falls into place. All right? And by the way, if you put them in the home, they're going to beat the home, the, uh, the ed public education system every time. Yeah. I cannot tell you the scores that my son, and I'm, bra I'm not bragging, I'm just saying they did extremely well on the, the uh, standardized test. Uh, they're both in technical fields, in engineering, so it can be done mm -hmm. if you want to do it. Now, what does education look like in a free society? This is where you would go. If you truly have unalienable rights, as the Declaration of Independence states it now, as only given by the Creator, no one should have the right to tell you who and how to educate your children. No one has the right to do that. Because now it's a God-given right, only given by the Creator. That's it. It's not given to you by the government. Okay? But the problem is, this has become the norm of society because now what has happened is, we have allowed the government to dictate to us what is best for our children. And this is where we get into trouble. There is nowhere in the Constitution where federal government is given a role to be involved in education. It's not there. You can't find it. It's just like somebody trying to tell me, they keep mentioning the word, we're a democracy. I said, show it to me in the Constitution. 
It's not there. Yeah. A sure republic, you know, it's not a democracy, right? All right? The Sixth Commandment states without equivocation, you shall not steal. Notice it does not say that civil governments are exempt or civil governments are can steal if the majority if they vote to steal it, it's still wrong. Okay? And um, if the majority of people will vote to steal it from you, that doesn't make it right. So a lot of people say, well, we voted it in. Well, I didn't. I didn't want my child to be. So you know what? Taking them out. I'm not putting them in there in the first place. I'm not doing it. Okay? But they say if the government, the people voted on it, that makes it right. No, it doesn't. It's still stealing no matter how you cut it. All right? Okay, Deuteronomy 4 8. This is where I was telling you where it goes back to the family. These words I command to you, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Okay? And they shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So the education was primarily a function of the family. That's the way it was from the beginning of time. All right. Now, notice how important it was. You should write them on the door, door post of your house and on your gate. It was to be splattered all over the place. So it's a constant reminder of who God is and the importance of education. <laughs> Ephesians 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and, more, and mother, which is the first commandment. Or, yeah, got that wrong. I got <laughs> Commandment was promised. And Kevin was supposed to be checking it for me. But he, naturally, he went out of town on it. Um, and then, so you may live on it. And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring up in the training again. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. See that? Biblical references. Education, again, was primarily responsible of the family, and then it extended out to the church. Now, can you imagine what would happen if the church was doing their job? Imagine, or imagine now. It, it, it could just, the church could turn the tide. For sure, for sure. Okay. Yeah. I asked earlier. I asked earlier. Okay. During the founding, during the founding of America. Excuse me. Uh, in a minute, yeah. Yeah, we closed about a half an hour ago. Yeah, yeah they closed at eight. Alright. I'll start wrapping well, this up. Um to about eight thirty, it doesn't say twenty two now. Okay. During the founding uh, of America, uh, from the Pilgrims all the way to the middle 18th century, education was all private. All right. Um, in fact, in fact, as, as, as late as 1860, the state, there were only 300 public schools. All right. At that time, there were 6,000 private schools, and then the other basically were homeschooled. Okay. So it was. It was not really anything, public was nowhere to be found. It was just very scarce, if anything, okay? And I'll tell you how that even slipped into the system, that little amount that came into the system, okay? Uh, but the vast majority of education institutions were at home. That's what they did, all right? Freedom gives education a more long-term generational prospect. Now you're passing a legacy of not only reading and writing, uh, and with particular your children, but also your own chosen worldview. So you decide what you want to go in your child's head, not the state. Um, so true, so uh, true society in order to be uh, called truly free must accommodate only private education with neither taxation to subsidize education nor civil government co coercion to enforce attendance. All right? Such a, a free view of society was in fact the American way for a very long portion of our history it is the only view that we can properly call free. It was once the norm, and it worked well. It did work. Now, if you talk to somebody about homeschool or private school, you know what? They'll call you crazy. 
They called me and my wife crazy. I said, you crazy, man. What about this? What about this social skill? Well, if you teach him about God, he'll know how to interact with people because he knows he has to respect people. He knows he has to respect law. He knows he can't go around disrespecting others. That's how God operates. So if you teach him that, guess what? You'll be fine. And the other thing is, you can't make all the kids the same. They have different personalities. My one son, son, he's is, he's a party animal. He goes to a party, and before you know it, he knows 15 people. That's just his personality. My other son is like my wife. He's like, like a, an introvert. He doesn't, he doesn't like to mingle until he gets to know you. So they're different people. So you can't say I can force them to be like me. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. They're just different people. So um, now here's what's funny about this. If I try to tell people that they are taking my money to educate their children, they will literally kill me. That's how, I mean, they, this, is, this thing has gotten way out of control. They'll tell me, let you, this is a right. They think it's a right for them to tax me and, and educate their children. No, it isn't. I didn't ask you to pay for my uh, child's education, so now what do you think you got to force me to pay for yours? Come on. All right. Talk about the religion now. Property ownership. That's also addressed in the Bible. Abolition of property in land. Remember when we said religion and politics don't mix? Well, when Horace Mann came in, he was a Unitarian minister. His view was that mankind could be perfected by proper education since man was basically good. See? He said man is good. He ain't that man. All right? Another detrimental view developed during the Enlightenment period to the 17th and 18th century. He went on further to say that it was absolute right for every human being to enter the world Entitlement mentality, which is also extended to health care, employment, it's all over society now. We think we are entitled to everything. That's what we are now. This belongs to the state and not the family. That was his view. And we said religion and politics don't mix. He did it. What did Hillary say? It takes a village, right? Yeah. <laughs> Public education from its exception was incapable of existing without socialism. You couldn't do it, all right? And this is still the case today. <clears throat> you gotta take from somebody else to keep that system going. There's some way you can keep it going, all right? The very nature of the system requires the government to claim ownership over at least a part of every, in everyone's property. That's the way it works. He's saying that the successful holders of this property is a trustees bound to the faithful execution of their trust by the most sacred obligation. And embezzlement and pillage from children and descendants have not less criminality than the same offenses were perpetrated against contemporaries. So he's saying the public school system uh, worldview, you don't own your property. In other words, you're stealing from the government if you don't share what you have. <laughs> Okay, that's what his view. He said you shouldn't even be a property owner. All right? But only a trustee of the property that really belongs to society. That's not really yours. Okay? And some people do not realize how much of your taxes are going to public schools because it's automatically taken out in escrow. So they don't even think about it. All right? But I pay attention to mine because I see what they do. Uh, because of this unitarian thought, Massachusetts was the first state to create a state board of education in 1837. And then it just kept going, kept going, kept going, going, going. All right. Uh, who owns the lands? Because we have accepted socialism, knowing and not knowing. Most people just willingly pay the property tax and don't even think about it or realize that the state is declaring their ownership. All right? The Bible nowhere declares that the land belongs to the state. Rather, the scriptures declare that the land belongs to God. It does not belong to the state. Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't own anything. Exodus 9 29. So Moses said to him, as soon as the Lord came out, okay, the city, I'll spread out my hands to the Lord, the thunder will cease, and there shall be no 
no more hell, that you may know the earth is the Lord's. Same thing here, the earth is the Lord's. And I can keep going and on because he states that the land belongs to him. All right? Now, Corinthians is the same thing, Leviticus is the same thing. Now, you ever heard of serfs? Okay. Well, serfs were people that lived in the homes and on the land in which they paid feudal lords. The World Book of Encyclopedia states that this arrangement is known as serfs. They must obtain permission from the feudal lord to build onto their home or make significant improvement. So once they have built on it or improved their home, they must pay the feudal lord an increase, all right, a special fee in order to remain in their home. <laughs> they say it ended in the 1700s. My contention is it's still going on today. It is. Feudal property tax. Yes. After you die, there's a death. Yes. Yeah. You're going to get evicted from the rest. I know it. We got to get out of here. Yeah, they close it. Um, yeah. Three. Three. Yeah. How about they another five things? Um, I'm going to skip through some of the description references. One of the things I do want to bring out here, Leviticus 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, if you own property, you could inherit it, and you could transfer that to your your, uh, your your parents or your children, whatever. So you can take a poor person, and that poor person can work his way out of poverty. That's how beautiful this works. All right. Uh, you talked about this. If you improve the property, you're going to pay a higher property tax. Most people spend their hard-earned dollars to pay off their mortgage, and they come to realize they don't own their homes. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, all you got to do is uh, don't pay your taxes. And by the way, when you give people the right to tax your property, you also give them the ability to control you. You lose building that, you're done. Building department? Yeah. I'll hire if you don't, like I said, if you think you own your property, I always tell people, don't pay your taxes and see what happens. All right. Can this be sustained? The answer is, no, it cannot. There's consequences for not following what God has commanded us to do in Scripture. Sin has consequences. The bad news is that there are curses associated with disobedience. But the good news is that there are blessings associated with obedience. And the beautiful thing about this whole thing is that God did not leave us empty-handed. Here's what he left us with. We just have to understand. And then we have this. Here's what we lack. I laid this out. And that is the end of the story because I had to rip through this so fast, but I'm sorry. Um, <laughs>